it's not about networking. It's about building those meaningful relationships that last and pass the test of time. Long after we have these platforms that tell us how many people are following us, what is really going to matter are those people that when you need something, those are the people that show up. You got to pick yourself up, go backwards and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Andrew Dudham, founder of Hims, Erica Nardini, CEO of Barstool Sports, Daniel Dubois and Whitney Tingle, co-founders of Sakara Life, and much, much more. Plus, we ask the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Unstoppable. Let's find out. Hi, it's Kara Golden from Unstoppable. We're so excited to have Susan McPherson here. Hi, Susan. Hi, Kara. I am I am still smiling from your Super Bowl ad. Yay! So excited. That was that was so much fun. I mean, it was. I'm still on cloud nine from our Super Bowl ad. It was. Well, you'll see in our little newsletter on Friday that'll be a mention. Yay! It was so great. So Susan, for those of you who don't know Susan McPherson, who doesn't know Susan McPherson, but Susan McPherson. <laughs> <laughs> a group called McPherson Strategies, which is a communications consultancy focused on really social impact and how brands kind of are merging together, some trying to figure out exactly how they do create social impact. And Susan, full disclosure, is not only a friend, but also an investor in our company, Hint. And so I was talking to her, I've talked to her many times about her incredible business and how she's helping all kinds of companies, including just, I mean, some of the bigger companies, but also some of the smaller companies, but Intel, Kate Spade, and Tiffany and Company Foundation, lots of, lots and lots of companies. And she's uh, in the midst of writing a book too, which yeah. maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that. But anyway, welcome. Super happy to have you here. Actually, I want to mention one other thing. So Susan actually did something that maybe you can jump into a little bit more, something very, very bold. Was it last fall? I lose track of time. Last June. Yeah, last June. Okay, and this is the beginning of the summer. See, I, I like lose track. I can't well, we, believe it's... We're living in Indiana. Yeah, year. right? January it's crazy. was a year. So really um, <laughs> working for Pro-Choice America and orchestrating response from, from overall the corporate community on, you know, she got over 185... <laughs> Actually, 360. Wait, what? Yeah. I, wow. Wrong info on this no, one. No, no, no. So the that's ad huge. Had, the ad had 175 company CEOs signing on. That's That huge. basically said, don't ban equality, standing up to state that the abortion bans that were passed in several southeastern states were basically going to harm business for that's all amazing. sorts of reasons. But after that dropped on Monday, June 21st, within a week- 200 more CEOs came on board. That's amazing. So it was it was that plus the social campaign that went with it. That's huge. Thank well, you. Well, I, you were part of it. I was part of it, but also the overall, the just the fact that you, you know, I think you're a master of bringing leaders together uh, too. And that was just another great example. While Susan is having a large sip of, of hint right now. A large gulp. A uh, large gulp. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other great stuff that she's done, including she was part of the delegation from the Business Council for Peace, where she's visited Afghanistan and Syria. I mean, well, lots. that's with that. <laughs> I'll just let you keep going. I know. Like <laughs> a, amazing stuff, you know, along the way. Oh. And then last but not least, before we jump into questions, Susan was named one of Fortune most influential people on, or women, I should say, on Twitter, Elle Magazine's top 25 women on, on Twitter and Fast Company's 25 smartest women as on Twitter as well. well. Gee, I so. must spend an 
insurmountable. I know you're on Twitter a lot. (laughs) Actually, you're my Twitter buddy. I always like, I I always love it when I see little Susan's face come up there on there. It's it's so fun. So anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome. So how did you get started? I mean, what was sort of, you know, you and I have known each other for 10 years, years, but like, where did this all kind of start? I mean, I mean, I've had, and I say this all the time, I've had nine lives, right? I think you get to a certain age and if you're a scrappy, curious individual, you have had a variety of professions and you've zigzagged and women in in essence find ways to be successful if the traditional route, like if they were hired by a company. I was with USA Today in the 80s. I was with PR Newswire for 17 years in a variety of roles. And I always say what would have kept, what kept me at a company that long was the ability to have different projects throughout the time. Um, I got to open our offices in China. I was able to create products. But interestingly enough, the last role I had between 2006 and 2010 was creating services for people who did corporate responsibility. Hmm. PR Newswire, for those who don't in your audience who don't know, used to, or they still do, companies would be putting news releases out to the world over the Newswire. And by just reading the Newswire every day, you would get trends, right? What's happening? And the company started to see about 30, 35% of the news releases going out from business were either talking about their environment, how they were curbing their environmental footprint, or they were funding a breast cancer walk, or they were hosting, you know, to raise money for X. Mm -hmm. And this was a fairly new phenomenon where we saw it in rising numbers. And like any company that's industrious, they said, "Mm, there's money to be made. Susan, go figure this out. So I had three or four years to do a deep dive into the world of impact. So impact and nonprofit was like never, I mean, you Well, I know as a young child, and I mean, I grew up with a a mother who was spent her much of her life working for public television, okay, who fervently believed that that was the best, you know, the best TV on. I used to say to her, Mom, why don't you go work for ABC or CBS? You'd make so much more money looking at our kind of crappy house. And and she would say, it's no, it's the content isn't as good. So that that ethos was in me. But also, I always had a bleeding heart for anybody that maybe didn't have, like, the necessary needs to thrive and live. And when I moved to New York City after going through a divorce in 2003, I knew no one. I knew my sister. That was it. And But I also knew that a good way to meet people was to get involved in nonprofits. So I sought out and joined B Peace, which stands for Business Council for Peace. They were an organization that trained women entrepreneurs in regions of conflict. So Afghanistan, Rwanda, El Salvador, because we believe the organization that when you have more jobs, you have less violence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the best way to solve violence is to get trained, get people creating jobs. Well, fast forward through this organization, which was literally a network of about 350 business professionals, the majority of which were women, that pooled their business acumen to help women entrepreneurs. I went to Afghanistan. It was the first time in 2005 I saw actually business being a force for good. That's amazing. And we didn't, we spent a week with them, but we put these women on a three-year program. And during that three years, we would provide them access, you know, we would train them on QuickBooks and we would help them understand how to market. And if anything, like one of the women, for instance, ran a guest house. So guess what? We went within our network to find people at Marriott. We went to people to find people at Hilton. You know, if there had been, you know, a woman making, you know, beverages, guess what? If I had known you, I would have called Kara Golden and be like, what knowledge can you transfer? So the mentorship aspect of, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, part of what we see in corporate responsibility today is skills-based volunteering, Mm -hmm. right? Companies will obviously support via checks if they can, but more importantly, or probably more what the way they think is we want to get our employees involved because employees feel like they want to have a sense of purpose. And if you have a particular knowledge, which most people who work at an organization do, that knowledge can be transferred. So it's almost more like that than than an actual, I mean, I guess that the role of mentoring comes into it, but I do think it's this, okay, what do I have in my brain that I can transfer to somebody that sense of knowledge is going to help them do their better job. So when you talk about corporate responsibility, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's essentially, you know, for our listeners, how, you know, how you would define it. Well, 
I mean, corporate responsibility over the last 60 years has changed immensely. And I won't bore your, t- your, your listeners with the whole kind of underlying history. But I will say we went from a place where companies did what they needed to do to keep regulators at bay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And checkbook philanthropy was the notion of a company being philanthropic, meaning whatever the purview of the CEO was, which was typically a white male over 50, that check would be written to the symphony or the hospital, whatever the local charity mm-hmm. was. Fast forward to today, you have, it's a, I call it a perfect storm. You have hundreds of thousands of Gen Z and millennials entering the workforce wanting to find purpose. Okay. You have consumers that now have all the information at their disposal that they can know what is behind the kimono. They can they can know what's going into the food, what is going into the you know the sheets at their hotel. I mean, we have this information. So we're making smarter purchases. Then you have the fact that we no, no longer believe climate change is a hoax and that we don't have infinite resources on this planet to which to use. Mm-hmm. So all of that coming together has led to this, well, companies need to be transparent if they're going to be successful. <laughs> and if they want to be funding causes, how do they get their employees involved so they sen- get a sense of purpose? And how do they do less harm or how do they do more good than harm and help the communities from which they operate? That's a very long-winded answer. But when I think of corporate responsibility, that's it. And if I was to shorten it down to two words or three words, It's good business. Yeah, no, absolutely. And do you think like the majority of your clients that you're working with or how would you sort of counsel like an entrepreneur, do you think it's about the company or do you think it's about the leader? Does it have to start with the leader? Like, I actually think it works better if it's if it's a two pronged. Uh And the first thing I often say to an entrepreneur or an SME, you know, smaller or medium sized enterprise, I would say, okay. You definitely need leaders in the C-suite to be making this uh, important. Mm-hmm. But if you don't involve your employees, it will fail miserably. Mm-hmm. So often I say it's as simple as doing a survey to find out what your employees care about. Yeah. But the notion of sustainability and building a sustainable supply chain and as simple as buying better light bulbs you know, and shrinking your packaging is something you can do. You don't need your employees to, to get on board. Right. You're going to save money if you do those things. And you're actually going to be, I mean, for the most part. But from a philanthropic side of things, a social side of things, I am a huge believer in having both. And it's like a seesaw, right? If the leader isn't saying that this is important, the employees won't care about right. it. It can't, it okay? can't be that. But if you empower early on the employees, they will have a vested interest in making it succeed. Yeah, absolutely. And I find from a you know, recruitment standpoint, too, that Huge. it's yeah, massive Huge. or retention as well. So, uh, you know, we're, as you know, I'm working on this whole initiative around clean water. And so we decided uh, one of our investors is actually an attorney, and she offered to set up this foundation for us. And so we're in the process of setting up this foundation. I barely talked to people at Hint about it. And they're like, oh, that's like, well, I mean, we're just in the midst of setting up. But it's amazing how like a bunch of these people said, like, when can I set up? Can I potentially talk to you about like how you guys are going to staff it? Yeah. What are the different? And maybe I can put a percentage of my paycheck in it. Totally. No. And I think like that's another yeah. aspect yeah. of it as well. But I think or maybe I can go do a run a race and raise money for it. Yeah. Or... No, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it can be, I mean, we've been laying out exactly. Yeah, no, it's really exciting. I mean, we've been laying out exactly what the foundation means yeah. overall. And it's not just around clean water. I mean, we're also we're in the midst, we haven't even announced this yet, but we're launching. You heard it a, here. Uh, you heard it here. We're launching a scholarship program at my former school, Arizona State University, and it's called the Hint of Entrepreneurship because I've been a that. huge advocate for entrepreneurship. And actually, what's interesting is you can be from any college to yep. apply for the scholarship. Typically, scholarships are like in the business school, yep. in the journalism school, whatever, oh, and you can be in any school. And basically, our hope is to actually take it across the U.S. into lots of different schools Mm -hmm. to get entrepreneurs to say, like, I'm an entrepreneur, I have a business idea, here's what, you know, I'm doing. So anyway, that scholarship will actually run out of the foundation as well. But so, I mean, it's interesting because people think, I think, often that they have to just have one kind of initiative. If anyone Mm -hmm. who knows me knows that I'm all about entrepreneurship, I'm also about 
you know, female empowerment, you know, also about sustainability around a lot of work that we've done around plastics and packaging mm-hmm. overall. But then also this clean water initiative, we finally were like, we should really get some kind of like credit for this, but also all of the work that we've done to date, but also look at from a recruitment standpoint, there may be people that really want to work on a lot of these different initiatives that, you know. And you are a B2B company too. You're not just a B2C company. Totally. And increasingly companies are saying on their RFPs, what are you doing to give back? Yeah. I mean, again, much of like when we think of corporate responsibility, we think of the consumer brand, Mm -hmm. right? But Increasingly, PwC, Accenture, Bain, uh, McKinsey, when they are, you know, responding to RFPs from Microsoft or Dell or any of these big companies that bring in systems integration or reorganization, it says, tell me about your carbon footprint. Tell me. So from a business perspective, this is really smart. And from, you know hiring, retaining, giving you more stories to share, which we all know storytelling is vitally important for any brand and any nonprofit. Well, and I also think (laughs) that, you know, especially in today's day and age when, you know, I look at entrepreneurs and they have, you know, a purpose or a mission, I am always saying like, don't stop at just your own company. Also figure out like, what other knowledge do you have? In our case, it was around you know, water. I have a ton of knowledge around water that, you know, we produce a product with fruit in it, but we start with water. And so I have access to a lot of the dirty secrets behind water and the cleanliness and the lead contents and arsenic and PFAS and all the rest of the crap that's out there. And so I'm actually bringing this to the forefront to actually help people, you know, understand this. But again, that's social responsibility, right? Like in corporate responsibility. And so I feel like there's so many, you know, companies that are out there that could do the same in their industry that are not doing it today. No. I mean, well, again, for a massive, for larger companies, sometimes I often say it's easier to turn a rowboat around than a cruise ship. Okay. Decisions that are made when you're a multi-million or multi-billion dollar multinational, you know, Cross many, many borders, et cetera. Decisions, anything that costs money takes a slog, right? And you have to get shareholders and, and you know, the board and everybody behind it. So things are, are a little less rapid to turn around. But we are seeing today there's something like 3,900 B Corps, companies registering as B Corps, which means when they, when they incorporate, they incorporate not just to make a profit, but actually to have a social impact. Mm-hmm. Okay. And they're measured as such. And those companies include Patagonia, Method Cleaners, Ben and & Jerry's. And believe it or not, Unilever is transitioning to a B Corp, which was going to take a long time. And you have to apply. And, and I'll be honest with you, as an entrepreneur for a few years, I could not be a B Corp or I couldn't even pass because I couldn't, at, when I first started, offer health care benefits to everybody. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to reapply now that I'm doing that and I'm able to do that and offer maternity leave. But the notion is, is to me, that's a helpful sign. If you go up and see 3,900, that means that, that entrepreneurs are very interested in building. Yeah. And if Unilever is transitioning, that's sending a big message to Procter & Gamble and some of these other players. No, I think it's huge. I mean, I think B Corp is, I think it's great, but I, I don't think that, you know, just because you can't qualify for it to no, be no, a B Corp. No, no, I think, no, no, no. Yeah. I just meant that for me was a bellwether that this is becoming yeah. know, much more mainstream than it ever no, was. No, I, I totally agree. But I also feel like there's people, I mean, I, I can't remember all of the qualifications, but I know some people are like, oh, you know, I shouldn't I shouldn't show up because I'm not going to be able to qualify for that. Like, I think it's still important just to still do what you can do. Oh, absolutely. And I actually encourage people to fill out the application just to see where they, Whether they yeah, yeah. It's, for me, I was like, oh my God, I'm doing that. Yeah. I need to stop, you, you know, need to stop I mean, and you need yeah. to, but it's a great education. So, but no, I believe even if you're a two person organization, there can be things you're doing every day. And you, even if you're a dry, like the dry cleaner down the street, you know what? You can give $5 to charity. Yeah. Right? No, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's such a huge thing. Um, so baby steps. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So what do you think is the biggest challenge for people when they're, you know, whether it's a company like a, you know, Unilever sort of that size versus, you know, entrepreneurs and sort of making this step and like, mm-hmm. you know, when they decide to hire, I guess the biggest step is hire, you know, 
whether it's you or somebody else like well, to come in yeah, to do it. Yeah. But, but then also like, what do you think is the hardest for people to kind of, I think the fear of that it's going to cost too much and uh-huh. they're not going to get a payback. Yeah. And if you're publicly traded and, you know, in the United States, companies have to report every quarter, mm-hmm. which makes you very short term focused as opposed to long term. Mm-hmm. And we know some of these things take a long time to show results. Right. Yeah. And but the thing is, I look at it this way with depleting resources. If if a company wants to be around in 20 years, they're going to have to be smarter no, about the fuel and everything they're using. Right. Yeah. I mean, you you distribute through Walmart now. Congratulations. But Walmart about 10 years ago, basically told all their suppliers, if you don't meet certain environmental criteria, we're not going to carry you on our shelves. Mm -hmm. And it was a massive, there was a sea change in how their suppliers were. Now, I'm sure you would have passed, but I'm saying like that changed a lot of companies in terms of their fleets and how they were delivering products, the size of the packaging, et cetera, because everybody wanted to sell through Walmart. Yeah. Okay. But I think the, the the difficulty now for smaller, for startups, I think for many years there was a notion like, well, I'll, t- I'll tackle social good and impact after I make profit. Mm-hmm. And I contend that you'll get to profitability faster if you make this part of your core mission. I agree. Okay. I think it's really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also what we realized is I think a lot of companies are already doing things exactly. that they don't Well, like, they don't realize. talk about it. Yeah, and they don't talk about it. I so. was just at KKR. Yeah. Okay. We don't associate private equity and hedge funds with giving back and, and investing in diversity and inclusion. I was so pleasantly shocked, I guess would be the word, to see all the good things that they were doing. And I was like, well, why don't you talk about it? And they're like... We don't, you know, we would rather focus on it. Now, that's their tact, and they obviously don't have a real consumer play. But I shared with them what I just shared with you, that there are going to be banks that will say, what are you doing before we work with you? Mm -hmm. I said, so you may want to consider down the road to do some sort of public, you know, speaking about what you're doing. If anything, you can be a leader in your space. Yeah. No, I think that's true. And I think more and more... I mean, I was talking to somebody who came from the media industry who's now working for a VC on exactly what you're talking about right now. And it was interesting because he said that, you know, they're doing a lot of things that they just don't get credit for and around social. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that person is doing internally. (laughs) They should talk about it. And I think it is probably the 2020 trend amongst, you know, the money guys out there. They just better be careful that they have the pudding to prove. Yeah. And also (laughs) try not to, you know, pull one over. No pink or green washing. Yeah. No, I think that that's super, super key. So speaking of investments, so you're a big angel investor as well. Well, not by money, just by amount. (laughs) By by number of companies. (laughs) So is this right? 14 investments? Wow. That's huge. And uh, women-led startups. That's been the focus. Okay. And how do you choose to invest? Okay. Do not follow my advice, listeners. All right. I fall in love with the founder. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not fall in love, love, like I'm not going to like go and make out with them. But I, I just, and I was asked this earlier today, when I did a lot of, you know, write checks for philanthropy, it was the same reason, Mm -hmm. because I cared, because I, I want to, I, again, want to see somebody succeed. And What dawned on me was when I started reading all the statistics about lack of funding going to women-led and certainly people of color-led businesses and minorities, I was like, well, wait a minute. I can be using some of that money that I do philanthropic and instead put it into business. Mm -hmm. I'm not replacing what I do from a philanthropic because I think we have – the nonprofit sector plays a very important role in our world. But I also love to help somebody realize their dreams. And I also only give or I only write checks if there's other things that I can be doing to help the company because I am not by any – I'm, you know, I, I'm not like over the top wealthy. I, I am comfortable. But I want to also – you know, I'm one of those people that I always live beneath my means. So I don't want to go crazy writing checks. But I also want to be able to offer up value. And as, a, as an entrepreneur myself, I have been able to build up my network through companies that I have funded. Well, you're a great angel investor and you're very supportive and you're constantly, I mean, as I mentioned earlier in the show, I mean, I I think you're a great networker too, which I think is 
you know, an amazing asset to have in an angel investor because you're just, you just know a lot of people and you're just sort of, (laughs) yeah, and you're scrappy, but you're also naturally like curious about just different people. And so you're, you're good at sort of connecting people, which I think is like a, you know, it's a great asset to have if you're an angel investor. And I love, I mean, thank you for everything that you do too there, because I think it's, it's huge. And, you know, you're always, the, the biggest cheerleader for lots of these companies <laughs> that you invest in, which is... Do you know I was never a cheerleader? Yeah. You Everybody were never. always think I was. Yeah. yeah. I, I was could a see gymnast. You be, I could see you being... A, I was a gymnast, too. Yeah. I could see you... God, didn't you so, hate... I hated the balance beam. Yeah. Actually, I was bars and vault. Okay. Were I my was two. floor and bars. Yeah. Do you remember the bruises you get oh, on your hip bones? I had huge... And yeah. ripping your hands? Yeah. Do you remember the chalk? Actually, I didn't really... My I had this weird thing where I never really, like, got blisters on my hands. And the rest, everybody else on the team. But I just never... And I oh. never, like, got calluses, oh really. It was like... It was a great... Well, it's because you're from Arizona. Your skin was already, like, I don't know. nice and tough. But it was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was... That. It hurt. It so was bad. crazy. So, uh, so yes. you just got back from Antarctica. Yes. And so, how? Like, I and mean, we've talked a little bit about it. But what do you think yeah. is is some of the key things that people don't know about? Like, what did you learn when well, you were there? Well, I learned everything there is to know about five breeds of penguins. I learned how they when they your made... pictures were amazing. Oh, thank yeah. you. It was funny because about a month before I went, somebody said to me, is this your first trip? And I, or is this, you know, yeah, is this your first time? And I remember thinking to myself, what, do you think people make like an annual voyage? And so, now I'm like, I'm already counting down the days to when I can return. So, and where, the, what's the name of the company that you? Well, I went with Lindblad Expeditions, who partners with Nat Geo. It looked amazing. And to me, why it was so valuable is I, again, I'm a consummate curious person and if I'm going to go to a place like that which is all nature I want to learn and I want to have an understanding of the species and not just be able to wave at them Um, we disembarked and then went ashore to various islands six of the seven days that we were you know after we went through the Drake Passage and therefore we were literally 10 feet or 12 feet excuse me from elephant seals penguins baby penguins a leopard seal, Weddell seals. And, you know, the penguins, you can't touch them. But if they come up to you, you just always have to give them the right away. And it's called the penguin highway when they come back and forth from the the water where they have like almost fattened themselves up for the day. And then they go to their nests and they actually will regurgitate the food to feed the babies. And it's just a beautiful sight. You could watch it all day. I think I was most you know, if I was to say like one lasting memory was the sheer silence. And all you would hear is the calving of icebergs, you know, when when ice would crash. And again, at night on the boat, you had naturalists teaching you about what climate change's effects are of the, the Antarctic and, you know, what lives under. There were two divers that would go and dive each day and then come back with footage so that you could see what what lives beneath the ship. And Lindblad only, you know, they they are, they do everything they can to be sustainable. I mean, all the food is local. So it's, it's brought from Ushuaia, which is the tip of Latin America. That's where Hmm. you board the ship. And no, they're not a client. But I would say for, for anyone who has kids and want to expose their children to probably one of the last places on this planet that has no inhabitants whatsoever, I mean, maybe there's parts of the Sahara Desert that you wouldn't really want to build a hotel, but I think it's really worth going. Yeah, um, I'm dying to go. It seemed amazing. You uh, know what was, I, I haven't been to Antarctica, but up well, in you Alaska. you and I share this passion for travel. Yeah, no, I love it. But what the one thing that I found interesting up in Alaska, I'd hear the noise yes. of the, you know, glaciers, you know, breaking, right? And I would think, oh my God, like it's so close. And it's actually like really far away. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. in general, like yeah. it's like you can hear it and the echo of oh. it just well, because like because there's no noise, like it just yeah. yeah. And that was the thing that was like so amazing, and like oh. we were talking about. I mean, I still that was years ago, probably I don't know six seven years ago now, and mm. I still like hear it, like I still mm-hmm. visualize it, and it was so yeah, it was so great. So. Well, when you go to Antarctica, you're gonna fall in love with the sound of a certain breed of penguins. It sounds almost like they're purring. So when you get to the island, you hear all you hear is like that excuse i did not mean to offend penguins but they and there's thousands of them yeah and it's just i want to put that like on my gps like i want to be listening to that in my like elevator surround sound 
That's so awesome. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You're making me want to book a trip there for sure. You, so, you got, but I'll this, get you. I, I will. I have a coupon. But the ship <laughs> just seems amazing too. And I know people always want to know, like, how did you do it? And, you know, and oh. what did you use? And yeah. whatever. Like, I just think. Well, that I will also say awesome. Lindblad is, la- is birthing a new boat and it's going to be like a high, like it's going to even be, I mean, it's not like. And again, I don't, it's not like one of the big cruise ships. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's not these like yeah, smaller. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there were 100 passengers and I don't know how, if I'd ever like to go on a huge. I mean, I have this maybe when I'm 90, I'll do the Queen Elizabeth, you know, and, and be that lady that sits there and drinks tea and then has a shot of something or a yeah. couple of shots. But I, I just think this is both educational and and we're living in a world where our where our environment is so we, we realize how valuable it is yeah. and I wanted to see it. No, I bet. I bet that's, that's huge. That's very, very cool. Well, you've made me want to go there for sure. So, so I always ask this question at the end. Well, in addition, what's your favorite hint flavor? Oh, pineapple. By pineapple oh pineapple is so good. Yes, I yes, love yes, pineapple yes. as well. So what makes you unstoppable? I always ask this of guests. We've talked about a yeah, few things yeah. and I really think, yeah. Well, you know. I have to say, Kara, what makes it's my joy of connecting people. Mm-hmm. And I it took me to be on the grand old age of 55, but it took me to be in my 50s to find out what my secret sauce was. That's awesome. And there's something about finding out the clarity and then being able to really own that clarity. You know, it was about maybe 10 years ago when I went with five other friends and we went on a weekend up in the Catskills in upstate New York to figure out our boilerplate or our our kind of elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. And literally, we promised each other that by the end of the weekend, we would have that and we'd share. And I remember it was like, I put down, I'm Susan McPherson, I'm a serial connector. And I remember laughing out loud, because I'm like, that sounds ridiculous. It's like, like, I'm a self anointed, right? But there is something to like, the self fulfilling prophecy, right? Totally. And you've known me long enough to know that when I'm not hunkering down and working, I mean, that's what I do. And I don't, I do it out of pure joy. Mm -hmm. And my, I have a book coming out next March, which is called The Lost Art of Connecting. And it's not about networking. It's about building those meaningful relationships that last and pass the test of time. Long after we have these platforms that tell us how many people are following us, what is really going to matter are those people that when you need something or you- I love it. Those are the people that show up. Yeah. Well, I think the other piece of your story that I love and that people are always like, I don't know, I feel like especially, you know, as you know, I've got teenagers and they're like in this hurry, right, to sort of like figure it out. And, you know, I think your story is an example of you started in one thing and like it's always easier to look back on things, hindsight 2020, yep. but yep. that journey kind of led you to this, yep. but you were always networking along the way. Yep. And that's what allows you yep. to kind of figure it out. Well, and I never, I mean, I founded my company at 48 and 95% of the business has been inbound. And the only reason that happened is because of these wonderful totally. relationships and not having one-sided relationships. And I will also say, and something to, you know, to talk to your kids about it's not the destination. Mm-hmm. It's the journey. Totally. And those doors that sometimes you're afraid to open because you don't want to see what's on the other side, there could be something entirely wonderful on the other side. Yeah. And I, I've always been that person who opened almost every door. My late papa said to me, nothing is a prison sentence. Of course, prison sentence. But the notion was, you can always go back. Mm-hmm. Like if you make a journey and you open that door and you don't want to stay on that side of the door, you can go back. And I think sometimes when you live that way, you it, it, life is full of good surprises and not so good, but that's part of the journey. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely, that's super great. And where do people find Susan McPherson and also- Well, in Brooklyn. And, yes. <laughs> on my and, roof deck. <laughs> and McPherson Strategies, but you're on Twitter. I'm I mean, you're Twitter. on lots I'm, of social, but I'm I would Susan say- Susan McPherson on Instagram, on Twitter. Um, we have offices in New York and in Chicago. And our website is mcpstrategies.com. Awesome. So, but you can always email me. Cool. I'm happy. I respond to almost all my emails. I shouldn't say that. Yay. Crazy. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much, oh my Susan. Gosh, thank so you fun. For, I could, we could talk all day. I know. Definitely. <laughs> thank you. If 
you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. Unstoppable. unstoppable.